So, uh, warm welcome everybody to today's session on the Nautilus experience. We're going to be exploring the whole, you, you know, dynamic area of team of teams, working in teams of teams. My name is Christopher Lowe, and I'm joined by a number of colleagues, Pim Harder, Chris Above, Jason Igani, and Gabe Abella on today's call. Um, so there's a team of us. You know, I think if we're going to be exploring the topic of teams and team of teams, we need to model that in our own, uh, in our own practice. So there's definitely a team of people behind this. And, um, you know, really excited to, to really uh, explore what I think is really one of the most dynamic and cutting edge parts of the field, the emerging profession of team coaching. And so, you know, uh, five years ago, when I got into the field of team coaching, I had been working with teams for a long time, but they tended to be one and done type of team building events and, you know, retreat facilitation. But I started to see that becoming a great team obviously needed a lot more than just doing an offsite every once in a while. Uh, and so that really led me to an interest around team coaching. And so for the last five years, that's really what I've just been doing is accompanying teams on the journey for three, six, nine, 12 months to really become, you know, more than the sum of the parts, right? Really to become a real team. But, you know, as that work has evolved, what I'm seeing more and more is, you know, organizations are becoming more interested in team coaching five years ago. You know, when you would talk about team coaching, you get strange looks, but now companies are investing in it, training up in-house and, you know, the field is evolving and it's really become a bona fide field. But, you know, the further you dive into the work with teams, you come to realize that coaching a team in isolation um, is only part of the equation that a team only exists insofar as it's creating value with and for others in the system, in the organization, other teams, other individuals, other stakeholders. And so very quickly, you start to see that teams are part of nested systems. They're connected to other teams. And I'm going to invite folks, if you could um, mute your backgrounds, if you're not speaking, that would be great. Um, and so, yeah, so you start to see that as you work with an individual team, the journey doesn't end in becoming a great individual team because you can optimize one team but have the unintended effect of sub-optimizing sub all the other teams that they're connected to. So that really takes us into the realm of how do we actually coach teams in relationship to all the other teams that they're a part of. And oftentimes teams are part of nested systems or a set of teams. So that's really our, our, our kind of theme for today. And uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules as we get started. We're going to invite you to use the chat window throughout. So let's definitely make this a dialogue. Um, you know, feel free to come on the microphone if you want to speak at times. Uh, we're going to carve out some time at the end of the session also to, you know, be able to have some free-flowing dialogue and all that. So given that we're kind of a larger team today, a few of us here on the call, I'm going to skip doing lengthy in, in, uh, introductions. Otherwise, we'll kind of take up most of the time. But uh, a distinguished group of team coaching practitioners coming from different walks of life, different sectors here, uh, different countries um, that we'll be drawing from throughout today's session. So let's give you a little bit of a, a preview for what we're going to do in this session today. And again, want to thank you all for coming. So we want to start with just a little bit. We've already started to see this topic about what is team of teams and why. So we're going to kind of ground there a little bit, then pivot into some sharing some examples and what we're learning about doing that work. Uh, I think for many of it's, it's kind of like a pioneering edge. Um, and so, you know, we haven't, don't have it all figured out, but we're starting to do more and more of that kind of work. And so, you know, being able to take stock and consolidate the learnings, uh, you know, is, is beginning to, to happen. So we want to do a little bit of sharing of examples and challenges, and you all may have things to share as well. And then we want to talk a little bit about the Nautilus experience, which is something that we've created as a really unique way to really learn about team of teams, but also build the capacity to do this kind of work. And so really excited to share with you a little bit about that, how it evolved and what it is, and to share some of the voyages that we have ongoing. We're doing two voyages this year, one in Cuba coming up in April and another one in July, and uh, you know, invite you to join us for one of these voyages. We think it's really unique um, and you know, it takes learning to a whole other level beyond what you can do even in you know, dynamic trainings in the classroom or in retreat centers really upping our game as a field of how do we actually prepare for a world that's increasingly interconnected, interdependent, and dynamic. And, you know, thinking about how we learn as team coaches and how do we disrupt our ways of learning to ourselves be fit for purpose to do this kind of work, which stretches us all beyond our, 
you know, current uh, state of development, right? So there's kind of a bleeding edge there. And uh, then we'll spend a little bit of time in open conversation. But just to kick this off, I um, want to start off with what is a team of teams? So we don't want to assume that we're all on the same page here around language. And in my research on this, uh, you know, Stanley McChrystal, the general, wrote a great book called Team of Teams, New Rules of Engagement for a Complex World in 2015, which really kind of put on the map the whole concept of Team of Teams. But if you dig a little bit deeper, some of my research, uh, I came across a Forbes article that uh, noted something, somebody named Bill Drayton. I think, Carissa, you may know this organization, Ashoka. You may have interviewed them on the Team Coaching Zone podcast, but actually had coined the term Team of Teams earlier on than McChrystal. And... Uh, defined it as really instead of a maintaining a traditional structure in which people work in hierarchies based on a function or a formal business unit, an organization operates as a constellation of teams that come together around specific goals. At the center of this constellation is a coordinating executive team, but the composition of each project team shifts as needed over time. Teams and team members work together in fluid, constantly changing ways the model emphasizes decentralized autonomy, meritocracy, and a sense of partnership. So I think what we're talking about here uh, is really uh, another kind of form of organizational design as organizations pivot from individual-centric command and control hierarchies to more team-centric designs. How do we actually start to look at what are the ways of organizing all the teams that are working in nested systems? Some teams are more interdependent than others but we're really kind of pushing the envelope of organizational designs that are really organized around the unit of analysis being groups and teams rather than the individual. Gabe and any of the other members of, uh, of our team, I'd love for you to chime in if you have any thoughts more as you think about what is team of teams. I know, uh, Gabe, we were on a webinar with you recently where you had a definition of team of teams, but I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what is a team of teams in your view, whether it's similar to the definitions on this slide or something different and you should unmute yourself. Yeah. I, I think I take another, uh, another look at this, uh, Krister is that, um, I usually look at, uh, when we look at is what, what does the actual problem require? Um, and so if we're in a problem space where there are complex problems, uh, complex environments, um, what is it that's required generally as a team of teams? So, and it shows usually an adaptive organization with uh, a few characteristics um, but decentralized uh, decision making and shared cautious are really two of the big ones. Um, but I usually look at the environment. So usually, intent, usually uh, there's a desire for human beings to break down complex problems into simple pieces, and that's where we run into problems. Which is, uh, you can't break down a complex problem into, into simple pieces. You end up getting what you described again as, as um, local optimization, so making the problem even worse. So I think that's one way of doing it. Is that if you have a complex problem, you can only take what I would consider like adaptable resilient uh, organizations to address those problems. And there's another concept that I, I'm, I learned about, it's called requisite variety, uh, which is you have to bring as many solutions as the problem space requires. So if not more solutions than the problem space is actually presenting itself. And you can only do that with really highly adaptable teams. So I think muted. Sorry, thanks, Carissa. Muted myself there. So um, we wanted to kind of pivot a little bit more, just building on you know some of the the what's already been said around what is a team of teams and why. And um, Gabe, I'm going to invite you back again because I know this is one of your areas. But there is something you know the whole idea of VUCA environments, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, has become kind of popularized in the lexicon you know, over the last couple of years. Now, interestingly, though, some of the teams I've been working with lately, when I use the word VUCA, they don't know what I'm talking about. So we shouldn't assume that it's widespread across all. But there is a sense that the operating environments that we're, you know, working in are becoming in increasingly interconnected, increasingly interdependent, fast, more dynamic. You know, organizations are rising and falling at a faster rate. And so there's something about the environments that we're working in that is putting pressure on mm. the traditional structure of how we've organized, you know, classically over the last hundred years, right? The modern command and control um, corporate hierarchy, right? has been kind of the dominant model, which has worked really well because it's created stability. It's created ways of scaling 
and for reliability. But the problem is, you know, the ability of these organizational designs to really be nimble enough and, and adaptable enough. So, Gabe, I'd love for you to introduce this idea of MISI sure. and link it up to the, you know, what's driving the need for Team of Teams. Yeah, so uh, MISI is a term that actually came from uh, McKinsey Consulting in the 60s. Uh, it was a way to uh, categorize uh, large groups of items and simplify them. Uh, and in a way that there's no duplication. So MISI is short for Mutually Exclusive Collectively, collectively Exhaustive. Um, and uh, it's sort of like a, you can follow an org chart. So one example would be, or another chart we, example would be, how are all animals in the world categorized? You can almost find out which kingdom and phylum and whatever, and to the point where you don't have to, you know that a monkey is different than a human being just by the way the categories exist. And this uh, concept of breaking organizations down or breaking ideas down was applied to organizations. So if you look at a traditional organization where there's functional units for everything, there's usually maybe a, a U.S. department, uh, you know, United States uh, uh, organization that's dealing with U.S. sales, and then there's an Asia department dealing with the U, uh, Asia sales, and then within those departments, there's people that are dealing with small customers and some people that are dealing with large customers, and then there are people that are doing technical work versus uh, people that are doing uh, writing work. So what happened is that we, we have found a way to break down all of organizations to be so uh, tightly or so, so, so um, fully defined and separated that we actually also designed out any interdependencies or any other knowledge that, that or interactions that could happen. And so the quote from the book here is that where org charts are tidy, uh, me see teams are messy or teams are messy. So um, think about your organization today. Is there an HR department that they only service one area? And within your HR department, do they only service different types of people? Are there specialists from that HR department? That's usually how probably 99% of organizations are based or designed today. Mm. Uh, and then that leads to essentially all the other problems we have is how are we addressing complex problems with very simplified structures in an organization? Mm. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Gabe. So I'm just going to pause here for a second, and I'm going to invite you guys uh, in the chat window, everybody on the, on the call today. When you think about some of the most um, highly trained and effective teams, who comes to mind when you think of really well-functioning teams? When you think about the greatest teams in the world, whether it spans from business, sports, military, any of these different sectors, what do you, what do you think of when you think of the, the best teams out there? I'd love for you to pop your reactions to that question in the chat window. Gabe was quick. Quick on the trigger, no pun intended there, in terms of your, your reaction, your answer. Astronauts, nice. The Red Arrows display team, cool. I don't know who they are, SAS. What's the Red Arrows display team? I'd love to hear more about that, Paul, if you're willing to come on microphone. I got a private message, say, somebody saying the Los Angeles Lakers. I don't know if that was intended to be private or public. <laughs> hi, yeah. hi, Krista. Can you, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you can, please. Go ahead. Apologies if there's any back, back, background noise because I'm on a train. So um, the, red, no the Red Arrows is the um, display team of the Royal Air Force in the UK. So mm. they're an elite um, flying display team. So uh, yeah. if you YouTube the Red Arrows, you, you'll get lots of uh, mm. video clips. But they um, they, they take um, team teamwork mm. and team performance very seriously. Nice. Thank you for coming on and sharing that, and for being on the call, even though you're on a train. That's cool. Um, so what do you guys notice about the comments in the box so far? Only a handful of people have put in. You see any categories emerging there? Or what are your observations just about the, the people, you know, the teams that you've mentioned? Yeah, very physical. It's interesting, with the exception of um, Bernie's comment of Pixar, right, the, the animation and movie development company, almost all of them are, uh, were actually military teams or working in, uh, you know, challenging environments, astronauts going to outer space. But one of the things that, you know, strikes me about all the teams you mentioned, most of them are not business teams. So when we think of top teams, we don't think of business teams, which is interesting. Uh, but a lot of them are teams that require high levels of practice, 
right? And uh, which is interesting that all of these teams spent a lot of time practicing in order to perform in the times when they need to perform. And so in organizations, we oftentimes maybe don't have that luxury or we haven't really um, internalized the idea that teams don't just come about from magic, that they require practice, right? They require iterations and cycles. And to the degree to which we can ramp up and accelerate the cycles of learning and performance in teams, maybe the, the faster we can get teams to a, a great place. But if you go into the Team of Teams book by McChrystal, one of the things he talks about, the Navy SEALs, and uh, you know, Gabe Capture, they're some of the most highly trained teams in the world. They spend up to 10,000 hours practicing so that when they actually go out on missions together, uh, they're able to really, de they, they use the language of shared consciousness. They develop degree, a degree of shared consciousness where they can adapt and react to the environment faster often than what the environment can throw at them. So it's kind of interesting when you think a little bit about that level of training. Now, what's fascinating in the book, Team of Teams, he said, even the fact that having all of these teams, and they had a lot of teams of highly trained Navy SEALs, when faced with a decentralized, you know, terrorist network like Al-Qaeda, all of that individual team effectiveness could not be leveraged because the teams were so tribal that within each individual team, they were so effective, but they couldn't collaborate with other teams even other SEAL teams, let alone their Iraqi counterparts and others in the coalition, that they couldn't be effective. And so what they came to find was that they were not designed for the kind of warfare that they were facing, that the command and control hierarchy of a command and control hierarchy of teams, you know, fell flat in the face of a decentralized network of groups and teams operating in a much more fluid and dynamic way. And so hence, you know, what they eventually learned their way forward and coined it later was they had to become a team of teams where they really could foster the level of interdependence and collaboration across teams that they were able to do so expertly in, within individual teams. And so, you know, just interesting to think a little bit around how do we actually, what can we, insights can we take from what does it take to become a great individual team where we have intra-team interdependence and start to really foster that across the teams where there's a need for collaboration across teams. So let's um, just share, you know, some examples of what this looks like. And, um, you know, I like to say to people five years ago, when I really doubled down to become a team coach and made my investment to do that, you know, I started a podcast, a team coaching zone. Um, you know, I had a few things to say about team coaching and I, you know, a lot to learn and I had lots of good quality failures. Uh, but I kind of feel like I'm in a similar place now around team of teams that uh, last year, I put out the intention that I wanted to do more team of teams work. And uh, you always should be careful what you ask for because you might get it. So I started to, to get some team of team work. And I, I feel a little bit where like I was five years ago around just starting to get my first wave of team of team engagements uh, under my belt. And so I'll just kind of kick this off and I'm going to invite some of the others on the call. And if any of you are on the call doing team of teams work, we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, I tend to work with a lot of leadership teams. And you know, leadership teams, highly effective leadership teams are really more the exception than the rule, right? Some research shows that about 20% of top teams or senior teams are effective, meaning, you know, more than half to 80% are not doing so well and many are, are doing poorly. So what I have found with leadership teams is, you know, oftentimes it's taking six months, a six month journey just to get that team to become more than the sum of the parts. You know, some leadership teams don't need to be highly interdependent, but more often than not, just coming together to share updates on different parts of the business isn't enough anymore to lead effectively. And so I think in these teams, the team leaders and teams I'm working with are more and more struggling with, that's not enough. We, we have to not only maintain the business, but we need to reinvent the business for the next stage of our evolution, right? So what got us to where we are today is probably not going to be enough to get us to where we're going. And so the journey to become a truly interdependent, highly effective leadership team is something that you know, I'm finding takes like six to nine months. Mm. So if I come out of the gate with leadership teams and try to take them plus all of their individual teams that they lead on a team of teams journey, they're really oftentimes not really ready for that. Mm -hmm. But what I've come to see is at the end of the six month journey, once they have become a unit that's more than the sum of the parts and are really creating value in that way, Oftentimes you could exit stage left there and the leave, leave the team on its own and it's prob you have probably transferred some capabilities that they can continue to replicate on their own. 
But in some ways, you have left the stage at the moment when the team has actually become an asset, has become a resource to yield and wield upon the organizational context. And it's oftentimes at that place when I find that the teams are really ready for team of teams work because they have become, you know, tight enough with each other, built enough trust, enough clarity of purpose. They've covered some territory together that their focus can shift away from themselves to really the stakeholder environment that they're working in. Um, and they developed a level of safety where they could collectively push into really then getting the next layer of teams that report into them together mm -hmm. as a team of teams. So that's a little bit where, you know, my work is stretching. Uh, I also do a little bit of work around large IT change where it's not so much senior leadership teams, but where we have lots of teams working on a large, you know, software implementation. And a lot of what's happening is the problems don't lie in the teams themselves, but it's what's being mm. dropped across the system of 10 or 12 teams uh, across the hierarchy. So, you know, that's another space that I've been playing in a little bit, but we'd love to hear, I know Gabe, this is a big part of your work. I mean, you're doing team of team stuff with thousands of people and I'd love to hear a little mm. bit about what this work looks like for you and, you know, for others on the call to share, you know, what does this look like? And, you know, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that you're finding in this work? Yeah, so I'll just uh, throw in um, what it usually looks like is um, intervening at multiple levels. So at a director plus a manager plus a work team level. So there's some uh, new skills you'll need to bring into the picture as you try and connect uh, the decisions that people are making at executive level to the, to the actual impact on the team. So one of the big things that we do is try to make organizations aware of their own interdependence. Um, and we do that by creating structures, creating systems, a like platform, if you will, on which they are generating that shared consciousness. Um, and then once they know their interdependency, then you're generating clarity about a goal. And, and any, any one person's or any one team's impact and contribution to the overall team of teams achieving that goal. Um, so all, all things that are easier said than done, um, but you are intervening at multiple levels of the system and helping them generate, build these muscles on how they can generate their own understanding of what's going on and uh, building in new communication uh, skills on how they actually are going to uh, interact both with their internal, but also maybe more importantly, their external stakeholders. And that's also a big change because um, usually most organizations sort of use the uh, communication with the external stakeholders as a sort of source of prestige or source of power. And so one of the things that we'll need to do is figure out how then to uh, distribute that power, uh, that prestige to the people that need that information or that need that support the most in, in, while they're actually pursuing the goal. So Gabe, I'm curious, unlike my you know, approach, which is a little bit more incremental where I'm starting with one you know, team that's in a special position in an organizational system and, and kind of moving incrementally it seems to me like you kind of get engagements where you're able to really kick off a whole team of team structure as part of the initiative. Is that fair? Because I mean, a lot of what you're, you're leading are software development yeah. kind of teams, right? That are doing financial software development. Yeah. So we're also um, have had experience recently just supporting um, some other coaches doing work in the consumer product space. Mm. Um, the answer is yes. And so uh, you operate the level of in invitation. Uh, so it might mm. start as you suggested, uh, Krista, at the executive team level and then creating awareness that, okay, well, if we just start here, your ceiling's going to be rather limited. The actual impact that you're trying to get from organization to be rather limited if we don't go below or to the next level of teams below. And opposite of that would be being invited to intervene at, the team, at a single team level. And then with that invitation, just through some teaming, uh, teaming activities and some structure there, we can reveal rather quickly their interdependencies amongst the rest of the environment, whether it's internal or external. Yeah. And then that... That, that then expands the level of invitation. Um, but that happens rather quickly because almost all teams are independent, interdependent with other people, uh, with their intellectual stakeholders, um, but they don't yet have a language or a, a, a structure to, to reveal mm -hmm. that to themselves and to their stakeholders. Great. Before I pivot over and see if Chris and Jason or Pim have um, other thoughts to share on this, Gabe, I'm curious for you, what are you finding yourself within yourself as a coach, team coach, organizational coach? What's the biggest challenge for you and I'm also, the mm. similar question, what are you finding with the teams themselves and the team, the leaders around those? What's the biggest challenge for them about really embracing the team of teams work? 
And we could probably mm. do a whole webinar on that, but <laughs> I just want to pulse you on kind of what, yeah. what hits you in the gut around that. And, you know, if folks, you know, on the call want to ask questions and, you know, comment, okay. feel free to chime in. I guess for me personally, um, I, uh, I borrow your term, Chris, um, you're always going to be on learning edge. Mm. So the system is so complex. I mean, a single team is a, is a complex social system, but then add two, add five, add 20 to that. Yeah. Um, so I have, I have a motto, never coach alone. And whether that's in the room or having mm. some emotional support immediately after or a phone a friend in the middle of the session, like you're just stressed out and I don't know what to do and how the people are responding. So just understanding that that's the norm, but mm. being comfortable with that, um, not taking it too hard on yourself, not, not being too hard on yourself. Oh, well, you've lost the room and mm. you know, this engagement is going down south. Well, that, that just is the normal process and you have to live it to actually be able to uh, allow yourself to believe it. Um, that you will get out mm. of it, and you, or you, but also then trusting in the room, so trusting in the capacity of the teams that you're working with. Um, so you don't always have to control all the interactions. So allowing the room to take that responsibility to manage itself and to actually reveal its own interactions. Um, and then really I want to pause that, on that because yeah. I, I noticed other, some people's heads shaking. Jason was there and I, you know, others, you know, I, I think there is something interesting about team coaches and you know, we, we learned this uh, on the Norway trip we did last year in the Nautilus that many team coaches are operating solo, right? And uh, tend to be solopreneurs or work, work in small shops where sometimes they go out in pairs, but oftentimes going out solo. And, uh, you know, team of teams work is really challenging. And I think that really can't go understated of not doing that work solo. I, uh, one of my first forays into team coaching, I had six teams all in the same room together for a day. Um, and it was a great day, but I did it solo because I didn't want to bring any other team coach into that <laughs> experiment that I was doing. Um, but by the end of the day, I was so exhausted that just trying to manage six teams and I had a good design to help, you know, the design can do some lifting, but yeah, that landed on me when you said that, you know, just about not going alone. But what about the second part of that question? So what are you finding uh, with the teams themselves and uh, the team leaders? Yeah, I will reflect. So, uh, I'll reflect back uh, to them, um, which is through the course of our activities through the day or multiple days, um, they really realize, or I, I, I guess I, I reframe the work as helping, helping teams confront the magnitude of their interdependence. So when the team steps back at the end of the day, the end of three days or five days and go, wow, I can't believe how complex our work is and how much we rely on each other. Mm. That, that then yeah. opens the door for them to realize what, what's right. required of them. But you have to guide them there because they've, they've worked in silos their entire career. Their, their reward structures are, are yeah. based on silos. Their management structures are based on silos. Yeah. So once you reveal that to themselves, then they kind of, they kind of, come, they kind of rise to the challenge. Yeah. You know, Peter Hawkins always likes to say that you know, human beings, we're all trained to see the parts. We're not trained to see the whole, right? And so he does this little exercise when, um, in trainings where he'll ask you to become aware of your hand and then verbally just to say, what do you become aware of? And if you just do that little exercise for a moment now, take note of what your attention gets drawn to. But more often than not, just to jump to the kind of punchline of that exercise, is you tend to focus in on the parts. You notice the cracks, you notice certain fingers maybe bent or <laughs> twisted out of shape like mine are. Um, you tend to notice the parts and not the gestalt or what is your hand communicating as a whole, right? Um, so it's really interesting that that happens also at the level of other units of analysis, like the team level, right? That uh, teams tend to not see the relationships between themselves, their stakeholders, or the other teams. But when given a chance to really just discover what other teams are doing in their system, naturally, the interdependencies oftentimes emerge in a way that they just never had a chance to really explore before, or even to surface and map, right? Um, in the, the story I shared just briefly about six teams in one room together, I started them at the individual team level and then moved them up to cross team just to go discover what the other teams were doing. I had a structure for that and they came back just blown away by, by how much overlap there was, how much interdependency there was, um, really, and how much opportunity there was to create so much more value. So I'm curious, Jason, Chris, Pim, anything to add to the ways that the team of teams is showing up for you in the different kinds of environments. And what I love about some of the, of our, our group on this call is we're working really across the board from financial services to tech, to real estate, to international organizations, education, nonprofits, you, you, you name it. So, yeah. 
Love to hear from you guys. Chris, I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, let me give you an idea. Uh, something where I'm working again I tend to work with leadership teams and I have worked with a leadership team over sort of 18 months I've, I've known the organization for 10 years I have good close relationships with them and the CEO confided in me look this leadership team we're pretty much needing to exit now and we haven't got enough leaders and we need to and we've got this fantastic culture so we want to build a staircase for leadership across this organization. We're a European organization. We're growing fast. And uh, rather than just go and do let's hunt for the one or two people, the heroes who are going to be the next successors for each of the leadership team members, uh, I presented him with this like, sort of team of teams learning approach to create a developmental organization where they could move from a very hero leadership model. He's been this kind of amazing figure, formidable figure, to a more shared leadership model where there's systems leadership, and that we would create a leadership development program which would also not only support the individual, but the whole way it was organized was to build the interconnectedness across people, nothing to do with functions, nothing to do with location. And so we launched this year-long program I've designed for today. And the, uh, you know what, what the first thing was we said is, if we're really looking to believe that he wanted to create a culture of inclusivity and diversity, also recognizing that not enough women, they, we first thing was to create a um, self-selecting leadership development program, which was unheard of, I think. Uh, out of this organization, more than 70 people applied. That's mm. like that's more than a, you know, enormous amount. Mm. And what we've done is the way we launched it is, creating uh, learning teams so there are seven learning teams i got the learning teams to pick the leadership team members so always in you know sharing a bit like abe what gabe was saying you know you've got the executive working with the team workers working with the managers so you have seven learning teams you've got a support mental team you have the learning teams learning on different modules you have learning teams working together to support the individual to challenge to really get each individual manager as a team leader to step forward to become a better team mm. coach uh, and so the whole mm. the whole way is to rapidly over a year accelerate um, and scale leadership across this organization um, and uh, yeah, I've just, you know, that's what I've just been doing today. And, and, and it's, hmm. um, it is a complex Love problem that. they have. Uh, and, and it is a creating a developmental organization. So it's really shifting that whole leadership model and, and also developing that agility and adaptability hmm. that, um, that. I love that leadership development programs and learning teams as an entry um, into team of teams work, right? You know, we oftentimes, you know, I, we focus on, you know, leadership teams and operational or task producing teams, but there's this whole space of learning and innovation teams, right? That need yeah. to be having exactly. spaces where it's not predetermined what they're going to work on, but where they need to discover the ways forward, right? And we'll come to that in a moment. When we start to pivot over to the Nautilus around really um, building our capacity to work with uncertainty and learning our way forward rather than having that figured out. But um, Jason, would love to get your voice in because I know you do some great work in the international development sector and I'm curious, are you seeing team of teams yet? I know you and I were working together years ago to start to get um, coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching, let alone team coaching started in the, um, in the international sector. But uh, I'm curious what you're seeing, if you want to unmute and come on. Yeah. Hello, Christopher. Hello, everyone. Um, I, absolutely. I mean, in terms of am I seeing a movement towards um, more inter interdependent ways of working? Absolutely. I think uh, my own work in that that space has has certainly shifted more to um, helping to design actual leadership teams. Um, I think people recognizing that what what people were calling leadership teams were really just loose collections of individuals um, that were working in a in a very disaggregated way. And um, so much of our work is about beginning to articulate the nature of these individuals' interdependence in their work. Um, and, and as soon as that starts, when that work really finds a uh, fertile ground, um, it naturally begins to create a conversation around, okay, well, we're, we're, it's more, we are not the only team 
in this office or in this region. Uh, our work is intimately linked with a number of other teams. And so what else needs to be done? I, I think w one thing that comes to mind in this conversation is, um, is the fact that every team, and this is something that, that many of you have said already, teams are not isolated in their operation. They, they are part of a much larger network. And if the context, the organizational context that the team is, is operating in is not incentivizing um, interdependent work, as much as the team recognizes the need for it, as much as the, as, as, as the individuals within an organization see the need for more collaboration, um, cross-functional work, the, the system itself can actually be the greatest impediment mm -hmm. to that happening. Um, which, which speaks to, I think, the, a more urgent need for speaking about team of teams as opposed to team building or team development. Because at a certain level of the work, um, you can't just intervene at one, set, one specific level and expect it to mm. uh, reverberate um, yeah. through, the, through the whole. So the yeah. conversation, our work um, is as much about supporting the individual teams that we work with as well as advocate for a much larger conversation in the organization around how yeah. to make this more integral. Yeah. You know, and I think one of the special roles we get to play is helping team leaders and teams understand what options they have available to themselves, right? That um, even just pitching team coaching, most teams and team leaders never heard of team coaching before, right? So there is an, uh, an opportunity to start to really lay out and plant seeds around what, you know, what the journey can look like. And, uh, you know, whether you're starting out of the gate doing team of teams or really starting with one team and growing into a team of teams, you know, I think we're in a, a position to start to plant those seeds. And, you know, I find with many of my clients, when I start talking about team of teams, they're really not ready, but it's, it's planting seeds. And, you know, eventually a lot of times those things are germinating into conversations later. Once they see the team evolve, uh, they become much more ripe to what's next and how do we leverage now the great work we've done. So I want to pivot a little bit into um, the Nautilus experience, which is, you know, one of the ways we've been trying to start to carve out, you know, Right now, writing books on team of teams with the select few, you know, individuals like General McChrystal and others who have really been living and doing it, we kind of feel like, you know, it's, it's really kind of a pioneering, exploratory space to really learn and experiment. And, you know, I know in the Agile world, there's a lot of emphasis being placed on trying to scale up, you know, uh, Scrum and Agile methods to large numbers of teams. And so there's pockets of this, you know, that I think are happening out there, but it's still a very early early days. I think it is the deer in the headlights time around doing this work. And so what we um, wanted to think a little bit about uh, in our team on the Nautilus experience is starting to look at how do we actually learn as team coaches and what kind of learning environments do we need to create in order to be able to do team of teams work. And one of the things we sort of were struck by is that a lot of our ways of learning in modern organizations are really mirror reflections of the kind of organizations we're in, where learning tends to be nicely curated, nicely clean and sanitized and organized, very structured settings where we come together, a lot of the emphasis on cognitive learning, sometimes with experiential and embodied or you know, emotional level learning. But for the most part, you know, the learning environments we've created really rarely reflect the kind of level of dynamism, the VUCA, right? The disruption that we oftentimes talk about. And so we started to really explore this a little bit. And Pim Harder, who's on the call, um, he's based in the Netherlands, does a lot of work with the education system, knew of a ship, uh, a Dutch tall ship called the Wild Swan or Wilde Swan, that takes young people on transatlantic voyages from Europe to the Caribbean in the winter for 30 days with their teachers. And they not only do their classes, but they learn leadership and team skills. And his daughter actually was one of the uh, one of the students on one of those voyages and really found just the transformational impact really um, powerful. And so we were sitting around, he and I, to a guy named Eric Koner from the Coaches Training Institute, and we started thinking about why don't we have a program like that for adults, not just to grow our individual capacity, our, also our capacity to be in teams, but how do we roll that up into a whole team of teams learning experience, which is really dynamic where we can't just plan everything out hour by hour over the course of a couple of days. And so we started with the first voyage in 2017, 15 days between England and Portugal, 
part of a tall ships race where Pim and Eric and I had never been 300 miles off the coast of a, of a country on a boat leading a program. So we were really putting ourselves out there. Um, but, you know, something really magical took place and we saw that the kind of learning we could do transcended, you know, just intellectual learning, but emotional, intuitive, embodied, physical kind of learning. And, you know, being together for a day or two, we can all be in our best behaviors. But when we're together for more than a couple of days, we start to see the good, bad and the ugly in all of us. Right. And so the platform for learning that you can get from that kind of experience is really powerful. So we did our second voyage last summer off the coast of Norway, and that was a 10-day voyage along the coast. And this time we invited Peter Hawkins, we invited Ruth Wagaman, Gabe Abella, Carissa were there, really representing different perspectives in the field of team coaching and seeing how we could bring all of these best thinking and ideas about team coaching into a team of teams environment. And one of the things I like to say, you may be familiar with this Kinefin framework, but it's a model that really describes the different kinds of domains that we operate in. So in many, place, in many organizations, historically, we've been in simple context, which is the realm of best practices, right? Where we can see cause and effect relationships. But that kind of doesn't hold true for many organizations nowadays. Most organizations are operating in, in a complicated level where actually the patterns are there, but they're hard to see. And so only trained experts tend to see the patterns between cause and effect relationships. I think this is where, you know, many of us who have gone through professional training in our fields find ourselves operating. It's the domain of expertise and, you know, specialized practice. But interestingly, as we talk about where organizations are failing faster, we're talking about the domain of the complex, where we don't really have line of sight further than six months, maybe 12 months if we're lucky but where what really needs to happen is emergent. We have to learn our way forward because even experts, expertise falls short when we're operating in complex contexts. And so what Nautilus is really trying to do is create a learning environment where we actually have a complex operating environment. We're sailing a ship together. We know where we're going, but we can't control the weather. We can't control um, just things that happen day to day. It requires an ability to work individually and collectively in a space of emergence, right, of emergent learning. And so when everything's planned out and structured, you know what's going to happen, you can bring your expertise to it. But in the moment when things are more dynamic and more changing, it really requires you uh, to be in a space where, you know, it's not so neat and clean and where it's all figured out. And we think that's a much better metaphor for what it's like to really work in organizations and to really start to build our capacity to work in you know, increasingly complex and dynamic environments that are demanding something of us that may be hard to really just replicate in a classroom setting. And so just some of the elements that we, we do in this, and there's a lot of things and it's hard to capture all in one slide or one you know, little webinar, is you know, we definitely do a whole thing around exploring team of teams in a dynamic and complex setting. So we have multiple teams and they all link together, both for learning how to sail the ship and getting us where we're going, but also to foster lots of learning individually, small team, and this whole system around what are we learning about ourselves and doing this kind of work and pushing our learning edges at multiple levels of analysis. So that's a big part of it. There is a whole piece here about sailing and you know, whether you're a sailor or not doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to have any experience, but just learning to do something physical gives us some real tasks to work on and uh, navigating the ship, hoisting sails, going up into the rigging, um, learning about the maintenance of the ship. You get to learn all kinds of things. Um, what's missing in my little Venn diagram, our Venn diagram here is there's a lot of fun and adventure. So it's definitely not a cruise. Um, there's a lot of learning and, you know, work we're doing and fun, but we, you know, things happen. The weather changes. It's beautiful. We can drop anchor, take a swim. There's all kinds of, you know, fun uh, recreation. In our last voyage, we had these wonderful people um, who had lots of uh, talent in terms of music and singing. So we, we had a really a lot of good time on the, on the last voyage, especially when the weather was bad. We kind of just, you know, turned around and, uh, you know, just hung around in harbors for a while before the, for the weather to be okay to be sailing. And, you know, we took advantage of those to really have a good time together and make music, go swimming and such. Um, also on this voyage, though, you know, there is a big thing about individual transformation and really gaining insights into yourself, you, you will become um, faced with things about yourself that you may or may not be aware of. 
um, things, you know, good things, but also, you know, uh, limitations in your edges. So I can't, I think everybody who's gone on this trip walks away reflecting on who they are as a person for months afterwards. It's hard to kind of distill all the learning down right after one of these voyages. It, you can't just walk away and be done with it. It kind of stays in your soul for a few months and you think about yourself, the teams you were part of the voyage. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty powerful. And then the final thing is just really around emergent discovery is what are we learning collectively to bring back? Um, we're not trying to design a cookie cutter program where it's all figured out. And there's a big piece here also not represented around our relationship to nature, right? There's a sense that maybe as a species, our relationship with the larger world that we're a part of is probably the most important relationship that we have to figure out if we're going to, you know, really survive and have a world that's sustainable for the generations coming after us. So a big part of Nautilus is about really reconnecting with nature in a much deeper way. Um, and, you know, the sea is a, is a big part of that. So those are some of the elements that we are trying to do. Um, I want to share with you just a little bit about the, um, the crew and the, and the team and the voyages we have coming up. And then if we have some time, we'll have some Q&A and some storytelling at the end. But typically on a voyage, we have roughly about 40 people on the boat. It's 200 foot long boat. It's a 1920s herring schooner, Dutch herring schooner that was redesigned to be a sail training vessel. So we have some, you know, team leaders. Um, so the program is really for team leaders and coaches. So it's not just for team coaches, but anybody out there who's working with teams, leading teams. We typically have a coaching team or a faculty team uh, of around four to five people. Uh, you can see some of the people on our team. Uh, last year, Peter was joining us. He's not joining us this time. Ruth was busy with the team today, so couldn't join this webinar. So a mix of us will be on any of these voyages. And then uh, there's a professional crew, a captain and crew that really, you know, ultimately holds accountability for making sure <laughs> safety is adhered to. And, you know, we learn a lot from them. They're an amazing team just to see the modeling that they do. And there's a, lots of insights to gain from seeing a professional, you know, nautical crew uh, and how they're operating. So about 40 people all together on this ship. And, you know, we're, you know, eating, you know, living side by side in bunks and, you know, um, you know, spending a lot of time together. So it's, it's definitely a, a rich experience. So we're going to be doing two trips this year, one off the coast of Cuba for six days and then a 10 day voyage off the coast of Norway. And um, we'd love for you guys to join us if this is up your alley. Um, but again, you know, for us, this space is not really so much a money making program because it's not, we're not really doing it so much for money making. It's really more for evolving, having a laboratory where we can really come together, you know, take the gloves off, be a little bit messy, but really together learn and evolve an area that requires exploration. And I think there's something powerful about being on these tall ships, which you think about the age of discovery when these ships went out, when they thought the world was flat and were kind of charting, going into the unknown, you know, chartering and mapping out what was out there. I think it's a great metaphor and analogy for where we are with team of teams and the kind of organizations we need to create to move into in the future. And so, um, you know, we, we feel like we have some things to teach about team of teams, a lot to learn. And it's truly a, an experience of co-creation of doing this together. And, you know, each voyage is unique. And that's one of the beautiful things about it, that we're sailing to different places. What happens on the journey is really different wherever we go, all within the boundaries of, you know, safety, et cetera. But a wonderful opportunity to create a unique, it's a unique creation every time. And uh, that's one of the things I love about it. And uh, one of the things that, why I'm so passionate about it. If you're interested to, to know more, you can uh, apply. We don't actually just let people sign up. They have to apply to be in the program. We want to kind of manage expectations with folks and see if they're a good fit for the program. So you can apply. We typically um, will set up a 30 minute call with you to go over. And so long as you meet some of our basic, you know, characteristics and screening, um, you know, you can join us and, uh, you know, we're giving out a special discount to folks here. We also do payment plans um, for folks as well, if that's of interest to you. So you can go to teamcoachingzone.com forward slash Nautilus if you want to check that out. and. What I'd love to do is just kind of open it up to some Q and A um, from some of the from the colleagues who were on the trip last year in Norway. If there's any highlights you guys would love to share that stand out for you as you think about yourself as an individual, about being in teams, team of teams, and also if participants on the call have questions, you know, feel free to pop in the chat windows questions that you have for us about team of teams, about Nautilus, 
um, yeah, we've got a, you know, a good seven, eight minutes left here on today's call. So maybe I'll invite Pim, Carissa, Jason, and Gabe, uh, as you guys think about our most recent voyage, um, what are some of the things that really st stood out for you about what you just learned about yourself or about teams or team of teams or just being in this, you know, this space that we're talking about today? You have to unmute if you want to come on and <laughs> share. Uh, well, go ahead. Please. No, please stress. Go ahead. Go, Jason. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to say there isn't a day that doesn't go by when I am not applying some of the learning from that trip. And that, that the point about you know, working individually as a team coach really, I think, came home to the group enormously that you need to practice being a team coach and part of practice being a team coach is to be working in a team. And, um, it's a very, you know, you really are playing at your edge, uh, your learning edge mm -hmm. for that entire experience. And there's just the most wonderful gift you can give yourself professionally and personally, and that it is just a big blast. I mean, it is just a huge amount of fun. And that when you come home and share what you did, other people's jaws drop and their eyes open. And, you know, there's, it's a big deal. So Chris, I'd love for you to share if, you, if you're willing that, I know uh, the women on the voyage last time have continued oh, as yeah. a group, as their own learning group, and love for you to share a little bit about that. Because, you know, one of the things when you're with people like this for days, you build relationships and many of them last afterwards. I was just in Miami working with a real estate team last week with one of the guys who came on the voyage last summer. But yeah, yeah. Did you say a few Thank words you. about that? Yeah, so, you know, I noticed in the chat window the word purpose coming up a lot. And, you know, we, we have gone, as Krista said, with the, the aim of saying, you know, what is, the, what is the purpose out there that we're looking to serve? And I was sharing a story at one point in the evening, and I found myself surrounded by all the women in a big circle. We just naturally formed into a circle, as women do. And we've continued what we call the circle of swans, where we know that we are a global network and, you know, formalizing it of uh, very seasoned team coaches, consultants, experts, looking to provide specifically support to women around the world who are involved in, with the SDGs and the Sustainability Development Goals out there in the field who may feel they need that support to help them to scale whatever impact they're trying to happen. And so you really see this kind of collaborative leadership model that we've developed and it's just huge fun um we actually have a meeting next friday um and 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 these amazing relationships that are continuing to bond the interconnectedness yeah not just at the personal level i say but the collective and very much about you know forwarding the purpose of how do we keep learning together and supporting the whole world at a tipping point uh, around this whole idea mm. of systems change yeah Awesome. We got a, uh, that's awesome, Chris. I love you sharing that. And we had a question pop up here and um, Srikanth says, you mentioned the Navy SEALs had to adapt to new conditions. Does the six conditions of team performance still hold true, true for teams who have, who have work in complex and ambiguous environments? So that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think when Richard Hackman and Ruth Wagaman developed the six conditions mm -hmm. of team effectiveness, a lot of the focus was on individual teams. Interestingly, after 9-11, in the United States, the CIA, CIA, the Defense Department, and FBI, um, the failure to share intelligence across these agencies led to um, them commissioning Richard Hackman to come in and do a study on interagency collaboration. And it's on my mm -hmm. shelf back here, but he published a book based on that research called Collaborative Intelligence, Using Teams to Solve Hard Problems. And in that book, he talks a little bit about, you know, applying the model across a problem that was a multi-agency, uh, government agency kind of uh, challenge. Um, I know Ruth is, you know, interested in pushing the six conditions framework. I think what we we have found is that team, you know, a, a multiple sets of teams having a compelling purpose, a clear goal, like what Gabe was saying, understanding if there is interdependency or not. Just like in a real team, do we need to be a real team? Similarly you know, in a team of teams, is there a need for interdependency and to what degree and to what area? So 
I think there are a lot of elements around designing the conditions for a team of team that uh, are scalable. Um, you can't take the team diagnostic survey as an individual member of teams and just aggregate a bunch of teams and think you're going to measure a whole system of teams. So the measurement isn't there, at least using the current framework. But you know, I think our initial forays of trying to apply the model in team of teams, there's lots of utility. Gabe, I know you've done a little bit, uh, or you're thinking a little bit about using, or you've been using six conditions as part of your team of teams work. Anything to add to that question, that great question from Srikanth? I, I think it absolutely applies. So one is you can't have a team of teams without teams. So that's the foundation. And then once you start thinking about organi uh, uh, organizations that need for uh, inter-team uh, uh, collaboration between teams, you're looking at the same things. Looking at sound structure, which is uh, are there norms of working that exist amongst teams that need to collaborate? You're looking at probably the next most important one for team and teams is a supportive context. So are there information systems that support collaboration between teams? Is there training that supports teams that need to work together? Um, are there material resources? So I think, to me, it's, 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 a, it's an absolute fit uh, the, way, the way I've been playing it. I, I, just, I, I don't know what I could, I don't know if I'd be, I could be doing the work right now with team of teams without mm -hmm. the initial six conditions framework. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I see, uh, Chris, you're going to do a podcast with Ruth on this topic. And, I, you know, offline, Ruth and I have been having lots of chat uh, about team of teams lately. So... Um, I think she's also of the feeling like it's really a good time to be pushing this envelope. She's part of a group of scholars at Harvard called the Groups Group that Richard Hackman created where pe scholars on teams are coming together to do kind of collective learning. And it's a space that she's been trying to, um, you know, I think foster some uh, conversation around team of teams, including the Nautilus. Uh, Jason and Pim, love to hear your voices. Anything, uh, stories from Norway to kind of start to punctuate our experience today that you guys would share? I, you know, I was looking at this uh, image of you, Jason, in this, um, uh, when we were on the Omani ship, there were other tall ships and Jason's on the top there singing and dancing. We had a great intercultural experience with a beautiful ship from Oman, the Shabab Oman. This is a fantastic um, ship that has 450 people, I think, on it. But um, anything stand out for you? And I'll ask mm -hmm. him the same and then we can, you know, formally end today's webinar. And if people want to stick around and ask questions, we can, because I see we're kind of at time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Nautilus experience was, was powerful for me. I think I, I must admit to some degree of training fatigue over the years and just feeling like a, a certain unwillingness to engage in conceptual conversations uh, <laughs> around uh, coaching and, and, and uh, collaboration and whatnot. Nautilus was very much an experience. And I think that the, the big takeaway for me was something that Gabe alluded to earlier. Um, in the process of developing my practice as a team development practitioner, um, much of my time is spent alone. I spend time working with teams, supporting them in their efforts to collaborate alone. I spend hours and hours and days traveling alone. And so the, the competencies that I hone over the, that I've honed over the years to be a team development practitioner have not necessarily, and this is, I think, the big realization, have not necessarily equipped me to be as skilled a collaborator, um, as skilled a, a partner, as skilled a, a team member. And the experience on the ship made that really evident. Um, that the times I struggled the most were the times where I needed to see myself as part of a larger whole. Um, I needed to kind of break down some of the the separations that in my mind existed between me and 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 the rest of the group. And I don't think I would have been able to see that had I not been in such an immersive experience. And so, in addition to the conceptual learning that this experience provides, it is also the very deep um, interpersonal. Uh, growth mm. that it that uh, it enables. So, thanks for putting that out there. It's very humbling. Yeah. <laughs> the insights we uh, learn about ourselves, right? But yeah, uh, it's so beautiful what you were saying, Jason. I think uh, you know, being part of the Nautilus experience is really learning about yourself as a team coach, and uh, 
you know, the whole collaboration part is, is so totally different on board of a ship where you can't, can't get off instead of a, yeah. a normal classroom environment where we fly in, you know, work for two days and then uh, you leave again. But here you're stuck, you know, we've got a saying on board of the ship, you can't hide who you are. And um, yeah, that, that's, what's, that's what, what is really happening there. Yeah. Another part of that, that I lo- like a lot is being in nature for, for a longer period. Being mm. in nature for, for seven, six or, or ten days is amazing. And um, I love that part as well. And I think that's a part that, that we forget about a lot. And um, yeah, so for me, it's really about who you are, the, 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 the thing you learn as a team coach on board of the ship and being part of nature is, is a great thing. Yeah. You know, what I always like to say to um, team coaches, one of the reasons why I love doing team coaching is it's uh, at the same time terrifying, it's also exhilarating, right? That mm. if you're not feeling any fear, you're probably not pushing yourself enough. And, uh, you know, for sure, my first voyage when we did the England to Portugal one, um, you know, I, I have to, you know, to be honest, I was terrified. I'd never been out on a boat, but I was also designing and leading a program I'd never run before. So I was like doubly, you know, terrified. Mm. But at the same time, it was exhilarating like uh, nothing else, you know. And just, you know, when the ship, um, when we shut the engines off and the wind takes the sails and the boat takes off, it's, it's a thing of beauty to really feel the interconnection of the ship, nature all the people on the boat and um, it's really just powerful, you know, being out in the ocean, which is so vast and limitless, but being very bounded on a ship, the counterbalancing of those two is just a, a thing to behold and uh, very beautiful. So uh, Chris, anything for you um, in closing here, We're just getting all the voices in before we uh, wrap up. No, I think it's all been said. Yeah. Uh, just really underscore everything. Jason said, Pim said, Gabe yeah. said, you said, nice. Yeah. Nice. Babe, I mean, Gabe, anything to add? Yeah, I love it. I'll take it. We're never going to live that down. Thank we're you. Gonna... <laughs> love it. I'll own it. We're going to use I, that I, for I just, a while. I also just want to uh, just highlight the fact that everyone that came on the ship was an expert at something. Mm-hmm. I can't think of something that I didn't learn from someone else there because our experience is so varied. So everyone has something to contribute to each other there. It's not just the faculty there that's leading the entire thing. This, this yeah. whole thing is co-created. Well, great. Well, colleagues, I know we've gone a few minutes over. Thanks for those of you who have stuck on here to the end. And um, we'll kind of formally end this part of the session. And uh, I'm also going to stop the recording as well.